So let's first of all welcome Prabhuji to ISKCON NVCC Pune by loudly chanting three times. <laughs> Although Prabhuji doesn't need any introduction, but for our own benefit, we would like to introduce him to the audience here. His Grace Vaisakhi Prabhu is, of course, we all know, he's an internationally acclaimed Kirtaniya, very famous for his melodious Kirtans and especially Bengali bhajans, Vaishnav bhajans. You must, all of us, in some point of time of a Krishna consciousness, have heard Prabhuji's bhajans and Kirtans. So it's a very, very rare opportunity he is with us here today. Uh, Prabhuji was born in London, England, uh, but he was brought up in Canada. That's where he uh, was introduced to music and he started as a rock and blues guitarist. Uh, in 1970, he found himself back in London and that's where he was enamored by Krishna consciousness, the devotion to Krishna. And in 1973, he actually committed himself fully to this path of devotional service, Bhakti Yoga. And in just two years later, in 1975, Prabhuji was initiated by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. And on his request of his spiritual master, Prabhuji journeyed to India in, immediately in 1975 to proclaim the renaissance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. He traveled the entire subcontinent, especially Southeast Asia, serving the mission of Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya. In 78, he arrived in Bangladesh, uh, where he imbibed the culture, actually, because uh, I don't know how many of you know, Prabhuji is extremely fluent in Bengali. Uh, he can read, write. He was sharing with us how he learned Bengali by looking at the sign boards in around Dhaka, Bengal, wherever he was traveling. And then he would remember them while reading Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, so, I mean, his, his style is extremely unique. It, it has both amalgamation of both the Western and especially the Bengali, real, pure, coming down from Narutam Das Thakur and Srinivas, Srinivas Acharya. His albums, numerous albums, uh, I mean, I can't mention all of them, but some of them, Charan Kamala, The Way of Love, Kirtan Rasa, Harinam Anand, Transcendence, Vrindavan Chandra, Chaitanya Chandra, Best of Vaisakhi, Sri Krishna Divyanam, that's one of my all-time favorites, uh, and, and lots and lots more. Uh, what I would also like to add here is Prabhuji is a prolific author, and I'm not sure how many of you have read his books. He has uh, published three books, uh, five, I'm sorry, five. At least uh, the ones which are, are world famous, renowned books are Radha Damodar Vilas Part 1 and Part 2. Prabhuji is already working on Part 3 and of course there is Yoga of Kirtan and other books which he has written. And uh, so today it's our great fortune that he is with us here. Everybody remembers the Narshing Arti. We all have grown up in Iskon hearing the Narshing Arti Prabhuji introduced through his CDs, through his music. So today, let's, from the core of our hearts, let's welcome him to ISKCON NVCC Pune by again loudly chanting three times, Hari Bol! Hari Bol! Let's get the roar a bit more <laughs> powerful. It's Lord Narshinga's appearance day. Three times. Hari Bol! Hari, Hari Bol! Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Oh, Hare Krishna. Uh, one more uh, important announcement. The translation of this class in Hindi is being done down below in the Bhakti Vedanta Hall. So anyone who wishes to join the Hindi class is going downstairs. Hare Krishna. Oh, sorry, I had to say in Hindi. इस क्लास का हिंदी रूपांतर नीचे भक्ति वेदांत हॉल में हो रहा है तो जो भी भक्त वो सुनना चाहते हैं हिंदी में वो नीचे भक्ति वेदांत हॉल में जा सकते हैं हरे कृष्णा
Yeah. And Prabhuji's class, so because there is no feasting, it's happening right at the dawn, in the, in the, at the time of dusk, sorry. So the class, we like to request Prabhuji to take class as much as time as he can. <laughs> All the way to dusk? Yes. All the way to dusk. <laughs> so how many are you ready? <laughs> Jay Radha Madhava Jay Kunju Dihari Jay Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Gopi Janavalava Jaya Giri Bharatari Go be Janavala Jaya Giri Bharat Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Jaya Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Banachari Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jaya 
Jay Radha Madhava Jay Kunja Bihari Yashodanandana Braja Janaranjana Yashodanandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Jamuna Chari Jamuna Tira Jamuna Chari Jamuna Tira Jamuna Chari Jamuna Tira Jamuna Chari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Yasodanandana Braja Janaranjana Yasodanandana Braja Janaranjana Yasodanandana Braja Janaranjana Yasodanandana Braja Janaranjana Jamuna Tira Unachari Jamuna Tira Unachari Jamuna Tira Unachari Jamuna Tira Unachari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Vihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Vihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jai Sri Sri Radha Kunj Bihari Ki Jai Jai Sri Sri Radha Vrindavan Chandra Ki Jai 
जाए श्री श्री राधा मदन मोहन की जाए जाए श्री श्री राधा गोविंद की जाए जाए श्री श्री राधा गोपीनाथ की जाए जाए श्री श्री राधा दामोदार की जाए जाए श्री श्री राधे गिरिधारी की जाए जाए श्री श्री राधा श्याम सुंदर की जाए गौर प्रेम आनंद हरि हरि बो श्रीला प्रभु बाद की थैंक यू वेरी मच सो वर कंटिन्यूइंग आवर स्टडी of the Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 8th Chapter, entitled, The Lord Slays Hiranyakashipu, the King of the Demons. So today is Sri Narasinga Avirbhav Titi. So we're going to read here the appearance of Sri Narasinga to protect his devotee Prahlad. So text number 17. Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narottamam Devim Saraswatim Vyasam चतुर्दायो मुदिराएत नष्ट प्रायेश वबद्रेशु निचम भागवत सेवया भागवत युत्तमश्लोके भक्तिर बद्धि नाइष्टिके ओम ज्ञान तमिरंजस्या Jananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tazmai Sri Gurve Namaha Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langhaya Tegirim यत् कृपातम हम वंदे श्री गुरु दिन तारिनं वंशकल्पतरुभ्यश्च कृपासिंधुभ्य एवच पतितानं पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama Hare Rama, Hare Rama Rama, 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 Hare Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Hare 
Sadikraman Putra Bada Pur Ojasi Ojasa That's a different one? Oh, okay, it is a different one. Here we go. Satyam vidatum nijabriya vashitam Satyam vidatum nijabriya vashitam Vyaptim shabhute shvakileshu chatmana Vyaptim chabute shvakile shuachatmana. Adrisha tatyad buddha rupam udvahan. Adrisha tatyad buddha rupam udvahan. Stambe sabhayam namrigam namanusham Satyam vidatum nijabritya bashitam Vyaptim chabuteshva kileshu chatmana Adrisha tatyad bhutarupam udvahan Stambe sabhayam namrigam namanusham Satyam dibutam nijabritya vasitam Vyaptim chabuteshva kileshu chatmana Adrishya tatyad bhutarupam udvahan Stambe sabhayam namrigam namanusham Mataji's Satyam true vidhatum to prove nijabrityabashitam the words of his own servant Prahlad Maharaj who had said that his Lord is present everywhere vyaptim the pervasion, the pervasion. Cha, cha and puteshu among the living entities, the living entities. And, elements. and elements akileshu, akileshu. All. all cha, cha. Also. also atmana, atmana. Of, himself. of himself adrishyata, adrishyata. was seen Ati very adbuta wonderful rupam 
form. Udvahan, taking. Stambhe, in the pillar. Sabhayam, within the assembly. Na, not. Mrigam, an animal. Na, nor. Manusham, a human being. Translation, by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. To prove that the statement of His servant, Prahlad Maharaj, was substantial, in other words, to prove that the Supreme Lord is present everywhere, even within the pillar of an assembly hall, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari exhibited a wonderful form never before seen. The form was neither that of a man nor that of a lion. Thus, the Lord appeared in his wonderful form in the assembly hall. So this is the appearance of Narasinga Bhagawan. This form had never been seen before. This form Lord Narasinga assumed in order to fulfill the boons of Lord Brahma and to also fulfill the words of Prahlad Maharaj that he was present everywhere, even within the pillar of the palace. So Hiranyakashipu had been very, very angry at Prahlad because Prahlad was not becoming a demon. He was not learning economic development. He was not interested in Indriya Tripti. He was not interested in controlling the population. But he was interested in Das 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 Anu Das, service to the Supreme Lord. So he became very angry and he cursed Prahlad Maharaj again and again. And then he took up his sword and with great anger he struck his fist against the column. Because if the Lord is in the column, I'm going to show you that this is what I care for your Lord. Mm. So then, as Narasinga, I mean, sorry, as Haryanyakashipu struck that pillar with his fist and holding the sword in his other hand, ready for combat, then from in the pillar came a wonderful sound which appeared to crack the covering of the universe. This sound reached the abodes of the demigods like Lord Brahma. And when the demigods heard this sound, they thought, oh, now all the planets are being destroyed. So what was that sound that Hiranyakashipu heard and the demigods heard? It was the roar of Narasinga. He roared! <coughs> and that roar could be heard all the way to Lord Brahma's abode atop of Mount Meru. So, what happened next was Hiranyakashipu heard that tumultuous sound that no one had ever heard before. And upon hearing the sound, Everyone, all the soldiers and all everyone who was in the palace became very fearful. And none of them could understand the origin of that sound and what was the meaning of that sound. And then that sound, out of that sound, burst Hiranyakashipu. So Srila Prabhupada's purport, when Hiranyakashipu asked Prahlad Maharaj, where is your Lord? Is he present in this pillar? Prahlad Maharaj fearlessly replied, Yes, my Lord is present everywhere. Therefore, to convince Hiranyakashipu that the statement of Prahlad Maharaj was unmistakably true, the Lord appeared from the pillar. The Lord appeared as half lion and half man, so that Hiranyakashipu could not understand whether the great giant 
in front of him was a lion or a human being. To substantiate Prahlad's statement, the Lord proved that his devotee, as declared in Bhagavad Gita, that the devotee is never vanquished, Konteya Pratijana hi name bhakta pranashyati. Krishna says to Arjuna, you declare it boldly, Arjuna, that my devotee is never perished. So then Prahlad Maharaj, demoniac father, who had repeatedly threatened to kill Prahlad, but Prahlad himself was confident that he could not be killed since he was protected by the Supreme Lord. So in Bangla, we have a saying, it goes like this, Krishna rake mare ke, Krishna mare rake ke. If Krishna wants to kill me, who can protect me? And if Krishna wants to protect me, who can kill me? So Prahlad Maharaj, he was the personification of that. So he was completely fearless. Because if the Lord wanted to protect him, no one could harm him. And if the Lord wanted to slay him and take him back home, back to Godhead, he was ready to go. Who wants to stay in the material world? Not Prahlad Maharaj. Anybody here want to stay in the material world? Nobody. Kijai. <laughs> so then, uh, by appearing from the pillar, the Lord encouraged his devotee to the effect that, don't worry, I am present here. So Krishna also says that. He says, Sarva dharman paritya mekang sharanam braja. All these other dharmas, these temporary dharmas, these material dharmas, these concocted dharmas, you give them up. Mamekang sharanam, you just surrender unto me. I'll destroy all your pop karmas from past, present, and future. Moksha Ishyami, and I will deliver you back home, back to God at Masuchaha. Don't worry. Don't worry. When you tell someone, don't worry, it means don't have any doubt. Is it not? And when you tell someone, don't have any doubt, what does that mean? That means, trust me. So Krishna and Gita, he says, trust me. Just surrender unto me, give up all the concocted dharmas, and you'll come back home, back to Godhead. And here, Lord Narasimha says the same thing to Prahlad. Don't worry. I am physically present here. Trust me. I will protect you. So by manifesting his form as Narasimha Dev, the Lord also preserved the truth of Lord Brahma's promise that Hiranyakashipu was not to be killed by any animal or any man. The Lord appeared in a form that could not be said to be fully a man or a lion. So when Lord Nursingadev appeared, first there was that tumultuous sound, and everyone became terrified by that sound. No one had heard such a sound before because it was the, the roar of Lord Narasimha Dev. So Lord Narasimha Dev, no one had seen that form before. They'd never seen that form before. They'd never heard that sound before. So to protect his devotee, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, he appeared as Lord Narasimha Dev. Previous to that, no one had ever heard of or seen such a form. So when he appeared out of the pillar, he ran a Kashapri, he looked all around to find the source of the sound. What was the sound? And then the wonderful form of the Lord, which could not be ascertained to be either a man or a lion, emerged from the pillar. And in amazement, Hiranyakashipu was thinking, what is this creature that is half man and half lion? He was shocked to the core. But then he could understand that he is here to kill me because he was 
very angry. Lord Nersingadeh was very angry. Why was Lord Nersingadeh very angry? Who knows? Why didn't he just come out of the pillar and do pranams? Why was he so angry? Because Hiranyakashipu had tried to kill Prahlad again and again. And every time the Lord had to protect him. And in this way, Lord Narasimhadev became more and more and more and more angry at Hiranyakashipu. Because the Lord is equal to everyone. His mercy is equal for everyone. But if someone attacks a devotee of the Lord, then the Lord becomes very angry. And he uses his anger, he uses this violence of anger to protect his devotees and to destroy the demons. This is what Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita. Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chaduskritam dharma samstapakam he has to establish dharma. So he has to destroy everything that comes from adharma. Hiranyakashipu represented adharma. Prahlad Maharaj represented Sanatan dharma. So the Lord wanted to protect Sanatan dharma, who, uh, which was represented by Prahlad Maharaj. And Vinashaya Chadustrikam, he was going to destroy those Dustkrita people who are trying to advance Adharma. So this is going on in the world today also. The Lord is getting more and more angry because wars are going on and the Dustkrita elements are fighting and people are afraid, will there be a nuclear war? But there was already a nuclear war. When Narasimha appeared, that was a nuclear war. <laughs> no one had ever seen or heard of such a thing. And then Lord Narasimha Dev, he began to fight with Hiranyakashipu. Hiranyakashipu had his sword and he was trying to fight. And Lord Narasimha Dev would just flick off those blows, just like a mosquito is coming and you just brush them aside like that. And so Lord Narasimha Dev was fighting, but he was playing with Narasimha, with uh, Hiranyakashipu. Narasimha was playing with him like a cat plays with a mouse. And the cat has the mouse completely in his claws, but then he allows the mouse to slip away. And the mouse thinks, oh, now I have a chance. So in the same way, Lord Narsingadeva as a lion, the king of the cats, he played with Hiranyakashipu like this. And then Hiranyakashipu, each time the Lord would give him a little space, he would think, okay, now I have a chance. But finally, the Lord decided to stop this playing, and he grabbed him, and he went to the doorway, and he sat in a yoga position, Padmasana, and he put Hiranyakashipu on his lap, and he ripped out his entrails. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not inside, it was not outside, it was in the doorway, neither inside nor outside. It was not during the day or during the night because the sun had just set. So the day was over, but the night had yet to begin. He was not killed by a man or animal, but half man, half animal. He was not killed by any weapon, but by the nails, the claws of Narasimhadev. And in this way, Lord Narasimhadev honored all the boons given by Lord Brahma that, Lord, that uh, Hiranyakashipu had thought that now I am fully protected, no one can kill me, I am immortal. But he was defeated by the superior intelligence of Lord Narasimhadev, and he was slain. 
So this Leela is so important for us Vaishnav devotees of the Lord because we should all understand that because we are engaged in the seva of the Lord, we are protected. And we should not just understand we are protected intellectually, but we should understand it wholeheartedly. We should be 100% convinced that no one can harm me. Even though harm may appear to be there, but in the end, you're always protected. So maybe a devotee is thrown in the jail, but he soon comes out. He's not there for very long, and he's not slain by the demons. He's protected. So the Lord protects his devotees. So we should be convinced of that. And this is called Shraddha. <coughs> Shraddha means that you're convinced. You have full trust in the Lord. Shraddhavan. We have to become Shraddhavan. That we're imbued with this trust and commitment and and dedication to the words of the Lord, Harikata, so that we're always going to be protected. So then someone may ask, if we're always protected, why are devotees put in a perilous situation, like Prahlad was put in? Well, he was put in a perilous situation, but he wasn't harmed. He was put in a pit of snakes, but the snakes couldn't harm him. He was surrounded by elephants who were going to trample him, but they couldn't trample him. He was thrown in boiling oil, but the oil couldn't harm him. He was thrown off a mountaintop, but the Lord caught him before he hit the ground. So he was always protected. So the question is, why does the Lord even put the devotee into a perilous condition even? Because it's a test. It's a test to prove to the world how fearless devotees are. That's number one test. To prove and show to the world that the devotees are fearless. So you're put in a perilous situation, but you're not a fearful, and then you're protected. That's the first reason. The second reason that you're put in a perilous situation is as a test so that you can gain strength in the faith and in your shraddha. So Prahlad Maharaj was put in a perilous situation, but he had firm faith. So he gained more faith when he was saved. So the next time he was put in a perilous situation, he had stronger shraddha. And then when he was saved from that, he had stronger shraddha. So Hiranyakashipu tried to kill him in 10 different ways. And in these 10 different ways, Prahlad Maharaj became 10 times more stronger in his shraddha, in his faith, his trust, and his commitment that I'm protected. So that proof has to be there. That's why we're put in a perilous condition. Otherwise, if you're, if you're thinking, I'm always protected, but you're never in a perilous situation, then where's the proof that you're protected? then it's only an intellectual understanding, but we want a practical understanding. Yes, I was put in this difficult situation and I was protected by the Lord. Wow, it's true what the Shastra says. So now my faith is stronger, my trust is stronger. And each time I'm put in that perilous position, my trust becomes stronger and stronger because I'm always protected, always saved. So Prahlad Maharaj, is the personality that exhibits this quality of shraddha to the maximum degree. Full trust, full commitment, full dedication to the word of the Lord, the Harikata. So of the na Navavidhi Bhakti, the nine processes of devotional service, Prahlad Maharaj is always there as the representative for smaranam. He is the personality that best represents Smaranam. He always remembered Harikata. 
He always remembered the Leela of the Lord. He always remembered the form of the Lord. He always remembered the qualities of the Lord. He also always remembered the holy names of the Lord. He always remembered the instructions of the Lord. He always remembered the associates of the Lord. He always remembered the prashad of the Lord. <laughs> because he would offer everything that was given to him, he would first offer to the Lord. So in this way, we have to also become expert at smaranam. Remembrance. Remembrance. Harikata. We should always remember the name, the form, the qualities, the pastimes, the teachings, the associates, everything to do with the Lord. We should always remember. In this way, we're always protected. You know, my favorite shloka, and which I quote all the time, from the Bhagavad Gita is Ye Yatamam Prapadyante Tamstataiva Bajam Yaham. That as you surrender unto me, I reciprocate accordingly. Why is this my favorite shloka? This is my favorite shloka because Krishna is explaining to you how you can get his mercy. If you surrender 1%, you get 1% mercy. Surrender 10%, you get 10% mercy. Surrender 50%, you get 50% mercy. So I was always thinking, I should surrender 100%, then I get 100% mercy. Why should I only get 50% mercy? I believe that if you're going to do something, <coughs> you should get the full benefit. Why you should only get half the benefit? To me, that's not logical. So therefore, you surrender 100%, you get the 100% benefit, always protected. And who is a perfect example of that? Prahlad Maharaj. Who else is a perfect example of that? Srila Prabhupada? There he is right there, the perfect example. Srila Prabhupada always remembered Krishna. Srila Prabhupada's relationship with Krishna was so deep, he was Paramatma realized. He was constantly connected to Paramatma. He would speak to Paramatma, Paramatma would speak to him. He would ask Paramatma, what should I do now? Paramatma would say, go here. And then Prabhupada would say, where should I go now? Go there. Should I go to London? No, go to New York. <laughs> so that's why Prabhupada could never make a mistake. Because he was told what to do by Paramatma, who's Trikalagya. He says past, present, and future. It's not that Prabhupada was Trikalagya, and this is something that Prabhupada taught me. He, he explained in one class that a disciple should become perfect. Then he said, perfect disciple does not mean perfect like Krishna is perfect. That is not possible. We can't become perfect like Krishna is perfect but we can become perfect by surrendering completely to the parampara, to Krishna, Narada Muni, all the way down to Lord Chaitanya, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada. So Srila Prabhupada, he was completely surrendered to that. And therefore, he was connected to Paramatma. So he could hear Paramatma speaking to him. So when Paramatma gave an instruction, who, and Paramatma can see past, present, and future, Prabhupada would follow that instruction. Now there's a very interesting incident, and you may have heard this or you may not have heard, but in 1975, Prabhupada had come to Los Angeles. I was there. In, I lived in Los Angeles Temple for six months before I came to India. Prabhupada requested some devotees to come to India, so I was one of them that came to India. But before that, when Prabhupada came, he was being interviewed by many interviewers for the television, for the newspaper, for the radio. <coughs> and Rameshwar, who was the head of the BBT, would usually accompany Srila Prabhupada where he would go and be interviewed. So then one interviewer 
asked Prabhupada directly in a very challenging way, have you seen God? Do you speak directly to God? Very challenging. And Prabhupada's very humble. So he paused for a moment before speaking. And during that pause, Rameshwar decided to defend his spiritual master. He says, Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual master, he sees and he hears the Lord through the Shastra, through the scriptures. And Prabhupada turned to him and said, no, directly. <laughs> so we all have that mistaken idea. We don't know that Prabhupada is directly in touch with the Lord. That's why Srila Prabhupada is Abhai. He's fearless. Now I'm going to share with you another pastime of Srila Prabhupada because everyone loves Prabhupada Leela, right? And this one is very rare. Hardly anybody knows it. So in 1975, one of my services, when Prabhupada was there, well, even when Prabhupada wasn't there, one of my services was after the offering of the bog, I would go and transfer the plates, wash all the dishes of the Lord, and then take out the Mahaprasad to distribute to the devotees. That was my service. So when Prabhupada came, I did the same for Prabhupada. I would get, go up, get his Mahaprasad, and transfer the plates, and then bring out the Mahaprasad to the devotees. And when Prabhupada came, Many people would come from all over the country. They would <laughs> buy a ticket and they would come. So there were many sannyasis there. <clears throat> so one of the devotees who was there was the leader of the Mayapur Chandradaya Sankirtan party. His name was Bhavananda. And he was <coughs> heading out a party in America to collect for building Sri Mayapur Dham, building our Chandradaya Mandir temple there. So one afternoon, so I knew Bhavananda because he was coming and taking prasad every day. I was distributing the prasad, so I got to know him. So one day he told me that Prabhupada had requested him for a personal darshan. So I said, oh, you're so fortunate. So after lunch, Prashadam, he took rest. Prabhupada took rest. Prabhupada always took rest after lunch, Prashadam. And then at 4 o'clock, Bhavananda went to meet Prabhupada. And then later on, I, when I spoke to Bhavananda, he told me everything that Prabhupada had said to him. So listen very carefully, because this is very, very interesting. So Prabhupada welcomed him in and said, how are you doing? Prabhupada always inquired about your health and well-being. Oh, everything is good. So then he asked, how is the collection going for Sri Mayapur Chandradaya Mandir? So Bhavananda said, mm, not so good. Why? Why not so good? Because most people, they say no. They don't want to donate. They don't want to help. So Prabhupada said to him, well, don't feel bad if they say no. You just carry on in your service. And actually, when Krishna came to me and said, why don't you go down to the material world and fulfill the prophecy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I also said no. <laughs> That's what he told Bhavananda. Bhavananda said, really? And then Prabhupada said, yes. And Krishna asked, why don't you want to go? And Prabhupada said, because I'm afraid that if I go to the material world, I'll forget you. So Krishna said to Prabhupada, well, look, if you go down there, I promise you that I'll always be there with you so that you don't have to be afraid. You'll be fearless because you'll always know I'm present there. So then Prabhupada told Bhavana, so then, then I agreed and I came. 
So he told that story. <clears throat> now from that Leela of Prabhupada, I thought about it for many years and Krishna gave me a realization. Because perhaps you all know that Krishna says that he fulfills the desires of his devotees, right? So when you meditate on something, you have a desire to understand something, then Krishna fulfills your desire. Just don't desire Indriya Tripti, just desire to understand Krishna Leela, Krishna Tattva, desire to understand all those things and Krishna will reveal to you. So he revealed to me and I wrote it in my book. So now I'm going to share this with you. When Srila Prabhupada was born, he was born in Taliganj, a district of Calcutta. And in that uh, home, in that compound, there was one uh, uh, jackfruit tree. And so uh, under the shade of the jackfruit tree, because it's... A huge tree it spreads everywhere, it gives wonderful shade because it gets very hot in Calcutta, especially in the summer, unbearable. So Prabhupada was born. Now all his mother was pregnant, and the the uh, the um, what do you call them? The the ladies that helped the birth, the midwives. They were there in a special place, and all the men were gathered in another place. And all the family members were there, the uncles, the brothers, the cousins, the children, the grandfathers, everybody was there. And then at four o'clock in the afternoon, one midwife came into the room where all the men were staying and she went up to Srila Prabhupada's father, Gore Mohande, and she said, congratulations, you have a son. And everybody went, Hariva! This was 1896. So it was the day after Janmastami. So one of Gore Mohande's brothers, he said, this is very auspicious. The day after Janmastami is the festival of, of Vasudev, where they celebrated the appearance and glorified the appearance of Krishna. So, I mean, Nanda Maharaj, because Vasudeva transferred to Nanda Maharaj. So therefore, that festival of Nanda Maharaj to glorify the birth of his son, we should call this newborn son of yours, Nandulal. And everybody went, Harivo! Except Gaur Mohande. He said, yes, no doubt. This is a very good name, but I already have a name for him. He shall be called Abhay Charan, one who is fearless, having taken shelter of the feet of the Lord. So then what happened, this I'm just sharing with you how I gained my realization. The next step was when Prabhupada took initiation. He, had, he, he was a congregational member of, Gora, of the Godiamat, what we call a go, congregational member. He was a family man. He lived outside. He wore white. He had a business. But every evening, he'd close his business. He'd come to the temple, and he would lead the Gore Arti. He would lead the Gore Arti because he was the best Madanga player in the Godiamat. And then after the Gore Arti, in the Godiamat, they have bhajans. So they would bring out the harmonium and Prabhupada would sing bhajans because he was the best harmonium player and the best singer in the Gaudiyamat. So even though he was a congregational member, he was the most expert when it came to kirtan and bhajan. So even though he had not living in the mat, <coughs> all the leaders of the Gaudiyamat said he should take initiation, he should take diksha from Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So this was in Allahabad. So when the next time that Bhaktisiddhanta came, they recommended Abhay Charan for initiation. So he came forward and Bhaktisiddhanta asked him certain questions and then he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Abhay Charan. And Bhaktisiddhanta said, oh, you already have the perfect name. 
I will just add Aravinda. You be Avai Charan Aravinda. One who is fearless having taken shelter at the lotus feet. So the third step was when Prabhupada took sannyas. My third step of the realization, he took sannyas. And he was given the name of his uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Swami Maharaj, Go, Tridandi Goswami Swami Maharaj. Because in the Gaudiya Math they have sannyas names. So he became Swami Maharaj. But Prabhupada chose to keep AC, Abhay Charanaravinda. So he became Abha AC Swami Maharaj. And he had been given the title Bhakti Vedanta because he was so expert in the, his devotion, in his chanting, and so expert in understanding the philosophy. So he became Tridandi Goswami Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj, <coughs> which they said was Tridandi Goswami BV Swami Maharaj. BV is Bhaktivedanta. That's how they do it in the Gaudiya Math. But Prabhupada decided he wanted to keep AC. So he was AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj. Abhay Charanara Vinda. So realizing this, I put it all together. In America, we say connecting the dots. When you connect the dots, you come to only one conclusion, that Paramanan, Paramatma had infused in the heart of Gorman Mohande, you give the name of Abhay Charan to your son. And Paramatma had infused in the heart of Bhakti Siddhanta you keep the name Abhay Charan, just add Aravinda. And when Prabhupada took sannyas, Paramatma was in his heart. He said, you know, now you are fearless. Just like I told you, if you come, you'll always remember me, so you're fearless. So he kept AC, Abhay Charan, always fearless, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. That's why he is AC, BV, <laughs> Swami Maharaj. So he is fearless, having always taken shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. So we should always become fearless also. Prahlad Maharaj was fearless at the lotus feet of the Lord, just like Srila Prabhupada, because the Lord was always present for him. So we sing every day. We sing, by here Narsingha, Hridaye Narsingha, that the Lord Narsingadev is everywhere and he's in our heart. He's everywhere. He's in this column right here behind us. He's in the air. He's in the fragrance of the flower, but he's in our heart. But we have to have that shraddha. We have to have that understanding, that trust, that firm faith. Then we will become fearless. And this is the goal of the 26 qualities of the Vaishnav, devotee of the Lord, one of them is Abhai, fearless. If we're fearful, what does it mean if I'm fearful? Very soft faith, soft trust. In other words, andabishas, blind faith. So what happens when a disease comes? Where do you put your faith? In the medicine or in Krishna? Think about it. If a disease would come, where would Prahlad put his faith? In Krishna. Prabhupada, he always said, never take me to a hospital. Prabhupada was ill many times, and what did he ask his devotees to do? Chant. Chant the Maha Mantra, chant the Nusingadev prayers. So when Prabhupada was ill, who did he take faith of? Krishna. So when we're in a difficult situation, who should we take faith? Who should we take shelter of? 
we should remember this. Rake Krishna Mareke. If Krishna is protecting you, no one can harm you. Not some insignificant virus that nobody can see. You don't even know if it exists. You have to have blind faith that there is such a thing as a virus. Just take faith in Krishna because you can see Krishna. He's on the altar. You can hear Krishna, his holy name. You can taste Krishna, the prashad. You can understand Krishna by reading the Shastra. You can smell Krishna by smelling the garland that came from him. So in this way, we're 100% convinced of Krishna. But where is the proof of virus? In order to, take, to have proof of virus, you have to take faith in someone else. We don't have in, uh, proof ourselves. So who are, we, who are those other people we have faith in? Conditioned souls. They're called scientists. <laughs> scientists are conditioned souls. They have four defects. They make mistakes. They have imperfect senses. They have the cheating propensity. Oh my God. We're going to take faith of such people? <laughs> take faith of Krishna. So let's look at Parikshit Maharaj. He's a pure devotee. But he became angry. He became angry because when he preached, when he uh, 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 approached the ashram of Samika Rishi, and he was dying of thirst, requested some water. But the Rishi was in samadhi, complete samadhi, didn't hear anything. He was in trance. He was not in this world. So Mar uh, Maharaj Parikshit became angry, and he saw a snake. So he was fearless. He grabbed that snake and he put it around the Rishi and said, here, this is your garland now for ignoring me. And then the Rishi came out of his trance. And now the Rishi's son, Shringi, was there. And when he saw that Maharaj Parikshit had insulted his father, he cursed Maharaj Parikshit to die in seven days Seven days. And when Shamika Rishi heard that, he chastised his son. No, 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 no. He's Parikshit Maharaj. He's our emperor. We should glorify him. We're Das, 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 Anu Das. So Shamika Rishi, he was a bhakta. He had bhakti. But his son Shringi had no bhakti. He had shakti, but no bhakti. So what did Maharaj Parikshit do? He could have called for all his ojas to counteract the curse. He could have done so much to counteract the curse. His armies could have protected him, surrounded him, so that no one could reach him. He had that shakti, that power, but he didn't. He decided, let me just take shelter of Krishna. This is a benediction. Now I know I'm going to die in seven days. Let me fix my mind. And in seven days... Go back home, back to Godhead. Ante Narayanam Smriti. Ante, at the very end, you have to remember Narayan. So he was going to practice for seven full days to only remember the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So at the time of his death, he would be transferred to the spiritual kingdom. No more Punarajanma. So that's another example. You put your faith in the Lord. Because for a devotee, we should know two things. Number one, your death is certain. It's guaranteed. You're all going to die. I guarantee you, the death rate is 100%. Science has made zero progress in this field over thousands of years. The death rate is still 100%. So you're going to die. But if you die fully conscious of Krishna, then Punarajanma is finished. So let's practice being fully conscious of Krishna. Just like Prahlad Maharaj was fully conscious of Lord Narasimha Dev. So on this day of Narasimha Jayanti, where he appeared only to protect his devotee, let, 
let's do the same thing. Let's have Lord Narasimhadev appear in our hearts. Today is the day he will appear in our heart, appear in our consciousness, and he will remain in our hearts and in our consciousness. We will be conscious of him for the rest of our life. Previously, we knew he was there. We had some information. But now we're going to have real upalabdi, realization. We're going to welcome Lord Narasimhadev into our heart. Welcome. This is... Narasimha Jayanti into my heart. I'm opening my heart to welcome him, to enter and to reside there. And that I'll be always conscious. Because right now, even he's there, but we're not conscious of it. Because we're still fearful. But once we're conscious that he's in our heart, then we will be fearless. So how to remember Lord Narasimha Dev every single day? So let me tell you the story of this book, Narasimha, The Lost Temples, written by Dhruva, a devotee in our ISKCON, who grew up, he was born into the movement. His father was the temple president of New Vrindavan in America. And they had a large Guru Kula there because they had many five, six hundred devotees, so they had many children was mostly a Grihasta farm community. So he was in the Gurukula. And at five years old, the boys were being taught the Prahlad Maharaj Leela and Narasimhadev. And Dhruva was charmed by that. He was so charmed and he wanted to be like Prahlad Maharaj. Now in the temple room in New Vrindavan, by the way, this book is so heavy because every page is high quality, heavy gauge, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? glossy, glossy paper. So this book weighs two and a half kilos. Every page is full color. So anyway, I'll put it down for a second. <laughs> so then he went to his father, Druva, and he said, you know, we have another Singha Murti in the temple. Can I do puja to him? So father's a temple president. He said, okay, so no one can dispute. <laughs> this is the advantage of having your father as temple president. <laughs> so every day he would do puja for Lord Nursingadev, year after year after year, as he grew up, become a teenager and then a young man. So at age 21, he'd been now been doing puja to Lord Nursingadev for 16 years, every day for 16 years. He was fully conscious of Lord Nursinga. He felt totally protected. And he was thinking, you know, I would love to go to India, to Ahovalam, to see the original Narasinga Murti. He had such a great desire. So he collected the money and he flew to India and he went to Ahovalam. And he was in ecstasy. He stayed for of over a week in Mahobalam. He associated with all the pundits there, all the, the uh, Mahants, all the Pujaris, all the Purohits. He was asking questions and he was just, and they were completely blissed out. This young man from America, we've never seen anyone who has so much bob for our Narasimha as this American young man. They were amazed. So then at the end, Dhruva said, so now I would like to go visit other Narasimha temples, please tell me where the other ones are. They said, no, 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 there's no other ones. This is the one. You are here, you're in the right place. Don't even think of other temples. So then Dhruva was thinking, how is it possible that in India there's only one temple of Lord Narasimha? Day? He couldn't believe that. So he was offered his pranams and he decided on his own he would try and discover other temples. So he spent several years and he traveled all over South India to the remote areas. And he eventually found 3,100 Narasimha temples. The, these were the lost temples that hardly anybody knew of, except the local people in that area. 
And one of those temples was right here in Pune. Who knows the name? Right, Sadashiva. Right? Speak louder. So, so you has everybody been there to take darshan? Why? Today is Narasinga Jayanti. Is today a good day to go there and take darshan? <laughs> It's the Lord Narsinga temple. This is Avirbhav Titi. So of those 3,100 temples that um, Dhruva discovered, he had with him his best friend who was a photographer, a professional photographer. They took photos of every temple. They interviewed the Mahants and the Pujaris of every temple. And then he... And then he published this book, which is 108 of the topmost Narasinga temples of all the 3,100. And the one here in Pune is one of the 108. It's in this book. <laughs> and uh, we've been, my wife and I, we have also been to some of these temples. And the most amazing one that we think is the most amazing is we were driven to this temple and there was no temple. It was just an opening in a cave. And they said, oh, you come here for darshan? Yes. You have a gamsha? No, we didn't bring a gamsha. Then get a, buy a gamsha. They sell gamshas there because you, you have to wear a gamsha. You have to take off your dhoti and put on a gamsha. Or you can wear your dhoti, but you have to go into the water, which is up to your chest. The cave is filled with water up to your chest. And you walk through that cave, and it's only about one or two feet above your head, and there's bats flying as you're walking through the cave. <laughs> and the water is full of bat stool. You really have to be dedicated to take darshan on Narasinga Day to go there. Many people, they start, and they become fearful, and they go back. Anyway, so we went... And you have to go for 108 meters like this. Somehow or other, it came to 108 meters. And then when you finally turn, you come to the end of the cave, and there's a pujari with a self-manifested deity of Lord Nursinga Dev. So when the pujari saw my wife and I, you know, we're white, Immediately he said, come, come sit with me. We came up on the altar and sat with him. And then he was telling us a little bit about Lord Nursingadev and all any other pilgrims who'd come, then he would say, just see these Westerners, how dedicated they are, like that. While he was speaking, I was looking at Nursingadev and I touched his lotus feet. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that's one such temple. We went to other temples which were in caves to see Lord Narasimha Dev. But in this book, he has just featured the gorgeous temples that were built, not the caves, because the caves is what's to see. So now this is volume one of this book, The Lost Temples. And my wife and I were traveling all over India and we're distributing this book. And people love this book. What we've discovered, a lot of people come up to us and they say, Lord Narasimha is our Ishtadev. And I went, oh, well, that's so wonderful. He's your Ishtadev. You know, you're at a Hare Krishna temple and Radha Krishna is here, but your Ishtadev is Lord Narasimha. Yes, wonderful. So why we're traveling around distributing this book all over India? Two reasons. First reason, in South India, <clears throat> People know about Lord Nursinga Dev, but in North India, nobody knows Lord Nursinga Dev. They've never heard of Lord Nursinga Dev. In North India, they're a little bit in Maya. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife and I, we want to distribute this book everywhere so that everybody all over India, North India, South India, East India, West India, everybody should know the glories of Sri Narasimha Dev. Sri Narasimha Bhagavan Ki.
So that's the first reason why we're doing this seva. And of course, we're being protected by Lord Singhadev. Everywhere we go, it's just so easy. There's no difficulty whatsoever. He's cleaning the path. So amazing. The second reason is that this is volume one. Volume two is going to be entitled Lord Narasimha, the God of Yoga. Because on t the day that today, on the Abhirbhav Titi of Lord Narasimha Dev, is the exact same day, you know, thousands of years ago, that yoga, the yoga process, came to this earth. That is the Hatha yoga process. The Bhakti yoga process is eternal. But the Hatha Yoga process arrived in India on the same day that Lord Narasimha arrived. And Lord Narasimha in South India for many thousands of years, he's called Yoga Narasimha. Why is he called Yoga Narasimha? Because he's always sitting in Padmasana. He's sitting in a yoga pose. Every other murti in every other temple, the deities are standing. Narasimha, he sits in an asan. So he's the god of yoga. But nobody knows he's the god of yoga. So we want to establish all over India and all over the world, because yoga is so popular now, that there is the god of yoga, Lord Narasimha Dev. In this way, we will attract many more people who are just yoga practitioners. And they may not be bhaktas. Oh, this is the god of yoga? Then we should, we should offer some respect and honor to him. Yes, good idea, no? So we're going to spread his glories all over the world. So the sales of this book, we're fundraising. We're fundraising by the sales of this book to publish the second volume, Lord Narasimha, the God of Yoga. And that book is going to be even bigger than this. It's going to have more color pages. It's going to weigh three kilos. If you think this is heavy, it's going to weigh three kilos. Now, one last thing I want to share with you, which is quite amazing, which has happened only by the mercy of Lord Narasimha. Lord Narasimha has protected Dhruva, who published this book, so much because as a young man, he came for the first time to India and he traveled all over to find the lost temples. What a seva he did for Lord Narasimha Dev. So Lord Narasimha Dev protected him in all situations. And some of the temples he went to were Gupta. They were far away. There was no roads. No cars could go there. No rickshaws. Sometimes he used to have to take a boat to go down a river and then walk for an hour and a half to get to that temple. So he did such wonderful seva for Lord Nursingadev. So Lord Nursingadev has now introduced uh, Druva. He, he sent him to the country of Belgium because Nobody knew, at least Druva didn't know, that there's a special museum in Belgium. It's called the Museum of the Sacred Arts. And Druva, although he, he, had, he, he had gone to all those temples and taken photographs and interviews, he also had taken murtis and other paraphernalia related to each temple. So he had this whole collection in his home back in America, of Narasimhadev uh, paraphernalia. So he went to this Museum of the Sacred Arts and he explained to them, he showed them this book, he explained that I have all this paraphernalia, I can donate it to your museum, and I have a second volume coming out. And he explained the whole idea of Narasimha, the god of yoga. So the curator of the museum became completely entranced and enchanted. He said, this is fantastic. No museum in the world has such an exhibit. We will be so happy to have this exhibit in our museum so that everybody who comes, and every day hundreds of people come to a museum to see the exhibits, would be so happy to have this. And then he said to Druva, but you know that we sometimes take exhibits on tour to different museums. So I will call the top museums in the world and tell them that we can take this Narasimha exhibit and with all the paraphernalia, the books and everything on tour to their museums. 
So the first thing he did was he called the British Museum. He explained everything. The British Museum said, yes, we would want this exhibit. Then he called the Metropolitan Museum in New York. They also wanted it. Then he called the French Museum, the Louvre in Paris. They also wanted it. So now Lord Nursingade will be, at his exhibits and his paraphernalia, the book, and his little murtis from all the different temples will be exhibited in the biggest museum around the world, in the most important cities around the world. Sri Bhagavan Narasimha Ki. So this is so, something so wonderful. So wonderful. So my, my wife and I, we consider ourselves blessed because when Dhruva contacted us and said, would you like to be part of this project? We didn't even know what the full project was. But we said, yes, we would like to do Seba for Lord Masingadev. And as we were doing the Seba, more and more of the project became revealed. And now we're intimately connected with this amazing project to get the exhibit of Lord Nursingadev and all his books and paraphernalia to go to the biggest temples, uh, sorry, biggest museums in the world where thousands of people come to the British Museum. Thousands of people come to the New York Museum every single day. And they're mostly tourists. They come from all over the world. And they'll see the Nurs the, Nurs the Nurs Singha Bhagawan exhibit, Harris Darshan. This is amazing. So this is spreading the teachings of the Supreme Personality of Godhead all over the world. This is worldwide prachar. So thank you very much. So my wife is sitting, she has a table, I think, out here somewhere. And she has these books. Please go have a look at the book. See all these amazing photos of all the deities and the temples and encourage your friends and family to do some seva for Lord Nursingadev by purchasing this book so that we can publish the second volume, okay? Thank you very much. Sri Narasingha Bhagavan Aki. Are there any questions on today's class? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Prabhu for a wonderful class. Thank you. Uh, Prabhuji, uh, I would like to ask a little bit of a description how uh, Lord Narasimha appeared and after that what no, no, Prahlad Maharaj was uh, expressions towards Lord Narasimha. So after Lord Narasimha <laughs> appeared, everyone was fearful. And then when he killed Hiranyakashipu, everyone was more fearful because they thought that now Narasimhadev was going to kill everyone in the palace. They were terrified. But after killing Hiranyakashipu, Lord Narasimhadev just went and sat on Hiranyakashipu's throne. And he gradually became more calm and peaceful. So Prahlad Maharaj was the only person in that palace who was not fearful. He was fearless. So he took a garland and he went to the Lord and he garlanded the Lord. And the Lord took Prahlad Maharaj on his lap, put his arm around him, and lovingly embraced him like a father embraces a son. Because that we have a loving relationship with the Lord. He's our father. We're his child. And then he said to Prahlad, tell me what you want. And Prahlad said, I don't want anything. I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I have your darshan. What else do I need? And Narasimha said, well, I want to give you a benediction. You tell me what benediction I should give you. So he said, well, for myself, I don't require a benediction, but you can give a benediction to all these fools and rascals who have no faith in you, that they become gradually your devotee, that they can become Vaishnavas, they can approach your lotus feet and become free from Punarjanma and finally go back home, back to Godhead. So the benediction he asked for was Pura Upakar, 
for the benefit of others, not for his own benefit. And this is the mood of the pure Vaishnav, the Maha Bhagavat Vaishnav. His main concern is always for the benefit of others. There's two kinds of people living in this world. Not three, not four, not ten, not a hundred. There's only two kinds of people. Number one, the first category of people are those who are always your well-wisher. Those are called the Vaishnavas. And then the second category of people are those who are not your well-wishers. That's it. You're either your well-wisher or not. So the Vaishnavas are the well-wishers of every living entity. And everyone else is only the well-wisher of themselves. The Vaishnava is thinking how to benefit everyone else, and, and the conditioned souls are only thinking how I can benefit myself. Now, this is not just philosophy. I'm now going to give you the proof so that you'll be 100% convinced, okay? So there's billions of people living in the world, in so many countries and so many cities, and every one of them is working for their own benefit. And what is their condition of life? They're always full of stress and anxiety. The Vaishnavas, who their only benefit is to, their only work is to benefit everyone else, they're never in stress and anxiety. They're blissful. So by working for the benefit of others, you become blissful. And by working for your own benefit, you become filled with stress and anxiety. So which side do you want to be on? Do you want to be the side of the well-wishers? Work for the benefit of others, and you'll be free from stress and anxiety. Now, if you want stress and anxiety in your life, then you work for your own benefit, no problem. But if you want to be free from that, and if you want to be finished with the Punar Janma and go back to Godhead, then you become the well-wisher of every living entity, work for their benefit. And then Krishna will take care of your benefit. The Singhadev will take care of your benefit. The Lord will take care of your benefit. You don't have to worry about it. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking to myself, well, who can better take care of me? Who can benefit me more, the Lord or myself? I thought, the Lord can do a better job than I can do, so let him take care of me. Choice is yours. So, Ma me kong shadunam, you surrender to the Lord, make him number one in your life. He'll take care of you. And he can do a better job taking care of you than you can do taking care of you. He can do a better job than your father can do. He can do a better job than Narendra Modi can do. <laughs> Take shelter of the Lord. Your benefit is guaranteed. You just think of the benefit of others. So Lord Chaitanya, he said like this, Janma sarta kori kora pura upakar. You perfect your life by working for the benefit of others. Your life becomes perfect. But if you work for your own benefit, does your life become perfect? The people of the world, their lives are perfect. Their lives are a mess. They're fighting in wars. They're lying and cheating each other. So you take shelter of Lord Chaitanya's uh, uh, order, his directive. Perfect your life by working for the benefit of others. Pora upakar. Koro pora upakar. Work for the benefit of others. I'll take care of you. And you go back home, back to Godhead in this life. And now we have a further proof. Lord Narasimhadev will back that up. He'll protect you. If anyone comes to harm you, they're finished. <coughs> you rip them to shreds. You're protected. How wonderful. How amazing. But if we don't have the faith, 
then the protection becomes less. Because Krishna says, Yeyatamam prapadyante tam sataiva bhajam yaham. As you surrender unto me, I reciprocate accordingly. So this is my favorite verse because Krishna is explaining here how to have a relationship with him, how to enter into an exchange relationship with him. I surrender 100% to him, he surrenders 100% to me. He takes care of everything for me. He makes all my arrangements, he makes all my plans. He takes care of everything. I don't have to think of it. I just wake up in the morning, chant Hare Krishna, and everything's already taken care of. I experienced this directly. Just for example, in November, my visa ran out, and I'd been extending my visa for so many years. Finally, the government said, go back and get a new visa. So I had to go back to America to get a new visa. So I got a ticket, I flew to Los Angeles. And I thought, when I come to Los Angeles, then I'll figure out when I, you know, maybe I can do some preaching here. I have to figure out how I'm going to get my visa, where, which embassy, to, and everything like this. Do I send my application to? How do I do all this? So I flew into Los Angeles. And then everything just manifested. Devotees appeared. They flew me here. They flew me there. They arranged this. They arranged that. Everything was taken care of. And after, you know, I was there for like two months. After the first month, I was thinking, oh my God, I haven't made any arrangement. And everything's being done. Then I was thinking, <laughs> what the Lord says is true. He's making every arrangement for me. I experienced it directly. So what I'm telling you is not something that I read in a book. It's not something that someone told me outside. It's my own direct experience. It's my testimony. So if it works for me, why it won't work for you? <laughs> works for everybody. Hare Krishna. Did I answer your question? Satisfied? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Thank you for a wonderful class. Thank you. My question is, I have been trying Krishna consciousness for the last 23 years. In spite of my genuine efforts, my desire, my endeavors, my sadhana, I have not come to that stage, so-called unflinching faith. So, could you please suggest me that in spite of chanting, in spite of doing all other things, with Heartful efforts. How do I reach that stage? Okay, very good question. Thank you. Everybody understand this question? Now I will tell you the answer to your question by telling you a story. Okay? So I was preaching in London many years ago and I asked for questions and one lady held up her hand. I said, yes. She said, just like you, I've been chanting this mantra for 20 years, but after 20 years, my chanting is just mechanical. No bhav. It's just completely mechanical. And I don't want to chant mechanically. I don't want it to become routine. I want to experience some bhav. So I'm thinking better to stop chanting mechanically. So then I said to her, Mataji, do you have a child? She said, oh yeah, I have a child. Do you sometimes find that your service to your child is routine and mechanical? Yeah, sometimes. Will you ever give up that service to your child? She said, never. I said, the reason is because you love your child. So you'll never give it up, even though it's mechanical. Even though it may be routine. Then I explained that mechanical service has a benefit. And I gave the example of cleaning the temple room floor. The temple room, after so many people are here, and there's a big festival, it needs to be cleaned. Jaru pocha is required. So some devotee comes in, and he's cleaning. And that cleaning is mechanical. 
but the temple becomes clean. That service is mechanical, but it becomes clean. So even when you do mechanical chanting, your heart becomes clean. And in order to... <laughs> In order to experience bhav, in order to taste bhavnamrit, Krishna bhavnamrit, first you have to have a clean heart. So the mechanical chanting cleans the heart. Then you can chant with bhav and experience bhav. So it's step by step. Now you say you've been doing this for 23 years. That's not a very long time. <laughs> Devotees join... Like Prabhupada, he started his movement. After 10 years, he left. So the most senior devotee in the movement was in the movement for 10 years. And, you know, the median average age of all the devotees when Prabhupada left was maybe four years, four or five, but more, probably four, maybe three and a half. Because in the beginning, few people joined. And in the end, more people joined. So the average was much less, maybe three and a half, four years. You know, I was only connected to ISKCON for four years when Prabhupada left. And we were thinking that the 10-year devotees were very senior. Now, I've been connected for over 50 years. And I don't think 10 years is very senior at all. 10 years is very kanishta. <laughs> 10 years is just a test. Can you last 10 years? You passed the first test. 20 years, you passed the second test. 30 years, you passed the final test. Three tests are there. Then you can experience, my heart is now cleaned, and I'm experiencing bhava. But still, after 30 years, and after 40 years, and even after 50 years, still I have seen that some people are still on square one because they committed aparad. In chanting the Maha Mantra and in doing seva, there's, there's nam aparad, there's seva aparad, there's Vaishnava Aparad, and of course there's Guru Aparad. That's the heaviest, worst Aparad of all. Then if you do Guru Aparad, Lord Chaitanya takes to the door, takes you to the door, opens the door and says, see you next time. You're not ready in this life, maybe next life. And they're gone. So after 50 years, we see that in order to make advancement, you have to chant without Aparad. You have to serve without Aparad. So of all the Aparads, two Aparads are the most egregious. And the first Aparad is to criticize the devotees, to find fault with the devotees. Sadhu Ninda. This is an Aparad. You have to stop the Sadhu Ninda. And I tried to stop the sadhu ninda, and it was a little difficult because I have a propensity for finding other people's faults. Ever since, you know, as a karmi, I was a fault finder. But then when I found out from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur the results of not doing sadhu ninda, then I stopped it immediately. So now I'm going to share with you how you can immediately stop the sadhu ninda and never find fault with another devotee ever again. Are you interested to hear this? Viva! So this is what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur described. He said that when a person has a fault, let's say someone's doing some seva, then there are faults. And there may be some karmic reaction for that fault. But if I find his fault, if I talk about his fault, if I broadcast his fault, then the karma that he would have gotten comes to me. I take his karma, and he's free. How many people knew that? Only one. Two. 
Now you all know. So then I was thinking, wow, I've been taking everyone's karma because I'm finding their fault. No wonder I'm not making advancement. So then I immediately stopped it. So then what happens? Naturally, other people will find my fault. They'll criticize me. So when they criticize me and find my fault, what do I do? I say, thank you. I know that he's taking my karma. <laughs> I say, thank you very much. And then I say, any other faults you find in me? <laughs> you might as well take all the karma. <laughs> so, so once I understood that from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, I gave up the sadhu ninda forever because I understood how it works. It was no longer some intellectual understanding, it was a practical understanding. And then the second thing that's, that's the most maha aparad is to be inattentive while chanting and to maintain material attachments even after hearing so many instructions on the matter. So we're inattentive while chanting. So Prabhupada said we have to chant with care and attention. So I was meditating on that with care. I have to chant carefully. And I, just like I care for my children, I have to care for the Maha Mantra. I have to have affection. I have to have love, devotion for the Maha Mantra. So care and attention. I should give my full focus to the Maha Mantra. So how many people have heard or read that if you chant the holy name of the Lord just once offenselessly, you can get Krishna Prema? How many people have heard that? Everybody. So now we understand to solve that problem of, of being attentive, inattentive, I only have to chant offenselessly one Maha Mantra. And then Krishna Prema rises in my heart. And when Krishna Prema rises in my heart, I'm never again inattentive. I'm never again focusing on material things. No, I give up the attachment, just like Dhruv Maharaj. He wanted some material benedictions. He wanted to get even because he felt slighted by the, his father, the king. So his mother was his first guru. She said, you know, there's nothing you can do, but you can pray to the Lord. So he, he left the palace. He went and performed tapasya and all that leela is right here in the temple. And the Ryan appeared to him. And he was meditating, I want the benediction that I can become the most powerful. I will teach my father a lesson. <laughs> and when Narayan appeared to him and said, what is your heart's desire? And Dhruv looked at Narayan and he said, oh, Bhagavan Narayan, now that I've had your darshan, all the material desires I had that I had previously have no more value to me than broken pieces of glass. I just want to have your darshan for the rest of my life. And the lion said, well, you better focus very strongly on me now because this is the only darshan you're going to have for me for the rest of your life. So you focus and Bring this darshan into your heart and have this darshan in the heart for the rest of your life. And Dhruva Maharaj did. And he went back home, back to Godhead. And he made sure that his mother came along with him. <laughs> so we have to solve the problems of the Aparad. We have to focus on the attention. And, uh, 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 be inattentive and not to be attached to material things. We have to learn not to find faults with devotees, not to criticize the devotees, because then you take their karma. So you carry on doing what you're doing and realize that mechanical has a benefit. It's cleaning your heart. Don't think that there's no benefit to mechanical. I'll tell you a story about mechanical chanting, because in 1976, you know, I was 
traveling. I was a book distributor. I was traveling all over India. We had two brahmacharis, myself and Sachin Narayan. We had a van. We would travel all over India distributing books. And we wanted to finish our morning program very quickly so we could go out and have more time for distributing books. So Satya Narayan said to me, he said, do you know that our godbrother Banu, he chants five-minute rounds? Five minutes? I was shocked. Really? Are you sure? Oh, yeah, he told me. And so I timed my japa, and it was seven and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes extra per round times 16 I think all this other time I could be going out distributing books. So I made up my mind, I have to chant faster. So I started fixing my mind and chanting. I got it down to seven minutes. Then I got it down to six and a half minutes, but I couldn't go past six and a half minutes. And I was thinking, how is Brahm Banu chanting in five minutes? So then I got myself a, an, uh, a digital clock where you press and it just it ticks one, two, three, four, five. Do you know how how much time has elapsed? They use these for uh, races. So I got one of those and I took the beads out of my bead bag and I was chanting like this, trying to come down to five minutes around, looking at the clock. And when it was two and a half minutes, I'd see am I halfway on the beads? And I was chanting like this. I got down to six minutes. I couldn't go any further. Then I was thinking, what am I doing wrong? Then I was thinking, I'm wasting time by my breathing. Because you can breathe out and chant Hare Krishna, but you can't breathe in and chant Hare Krishna. You have to take a breath. And every time I take a breath, I'm losing a second. <laughs> I was... This is, this is, I'm telling you the truth. This is, I was like that. So I would take a very deep breath and then chant like six or seven mantras before I ran out of breath and then take another one. But I still couldn't get the five-minute rounds. I was thinking, how does Banu do this? So I ne could never chant five-minute rounds. And then I realized that my chanting was mechanical. After doing this for some time, I'm really realizing that this chanting is completely mechanical. However, it had one benefit. I was fully tensioned, fully focused. I wasn't thinking anything else. I was fully focused. So I got the benefit of the heart becoming clean, even though it was mechanical. Then I decided, okay, now I want to do is I want to chant with Bob. So I'm not interested to chant quickly, now I'm interested to chant slowly. So then I was chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. But then it became very difficult to finish 16 rounds. So I thought, how am I going to solve this problem? I want to chant with Bhav, but I want to have time to do seva. I can't be sitting doing Nirjan Bhajan all day. You know, I was a young man then. Now I'm an old man, so it's different. But as a young man, you want to get out there and do some seva. So I came up with a solution. You want to hear this solution? So I thought to myself that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is my best friend. Prabhupada has said that. He has given me everything. He's given me every breath I take. And I realize that every breath I take keeps me alive. As soon as you stop breathing, you're dead. So that every breath I take is the most precious in my life to keep going, to do devotional service. So I had the realization that my breath was my most precious possession. And if anybody here has any doubts that your breath is the most precious possession, you come with me to the river. I'll put your head in the water. I guarantee in 30 seconds you'll agree my next breath is my most precious possession. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was thinking the Lord is giving me every breath. 
all the fruits, all the vegetables to nourish my body, the cotton and the jute to keep my body covered and warm, you know, the bricks and everything to build shelters to protect us from the storms. And so I was re realizing that Krishna is giving me so much. And what am I doing for him in reciprocation? And then I heard a class by Srila Prabhupada. And that changed my own perspective. And in this class, Srila Prabhupada was saying that we are taking the Lord's mercy for granted. We just take it. We never reciprocate. We are following the yoga process mostly for my own benefit. So I can go back home, back to Godhead. So I can be free from stress and anxiety. So I can be protected. You know, it's always me, 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 me. No one is chanting. No one, if you ask them why you're chanting Japa, how many people say, to please Krishna? That's why I'm chanting, to make him happy. So then Prabhupada said, just like the Lord is giving you so much water, you're drinking so much water, you're taking shower every day. But how many people say thank you? If I give you a glass of water, what will you say? Thank you. But when we get the water from Krishna, we don't say thank you. I come out of the shower, I just took it for granted. I didn't say thank you for that nice shower. Drink water, I don't say thank you to Krishna. So I came to the realization, I want to say thank you to Krishna. But then I was thinking, just to say thank you is not enough. Krishna is doing so much just to say thank you. Two words, that's not enough. I need to do more. So I was thinking, I need to give something to Krishna, a gift. He's giving me all these things as his gifts. So I want to say thank you and give a gift. And what gift can I give to Krishna? And I was thinking, well, Krishna has everything. What can you give to somebody who already has everything? And then I was thinking, well, there's one thing that Krishna doesn't have. He doesn't have my offenseless chant, because I'm not chanting offenselessly. So let me offer to Krishna one offenseless mantra as my gift to him to say thank you for everything he's done for me. So I put myself in a meditative pose and I say, Krishna, I want to now chant offenselessly for you. I want to give my full focus and attention to your lotus feet and I would chant your holy names with full feeling, bhavana mrit, and taste the nectar of your holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So I did this before chanting 16 rounds. Then I would chant my mechanical 16 rounds. So after some time, I was thinking, so I did this every day. And after some time, I was thinking, why don't I chant this offenseless one mantra to Krishna as a gift to him to say thank you at the beginning of each round? So I do it 16 times a day. If you can, become, if you can get Krishna praying by chanting just once, then by chanting 16 times offenseless mantra, just think how much Krishna praying you can get. So before each round, I would say thank you, Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And then chant my mechanical 16 rounds, so I'm finished my japa. So I'm sharing with you from my own life, from my own experience. I hope it's for some benefit for you. I hope you got some benefit from this. Thank you very much for your question. Any other question? Yes. Thank you, Prabhupada, for a very wonderful class. And bro, you, you mentioned in the class that Prabhupada, when he was in New York, I think, he was sick and he asked the devotees to pray to Lord Narsimha Dev that you please pray for my recovery. So, Prabhu, Prabhuji, I always think like 
when Prabhupada was in 1977, he was about to leave from this planet. At that time also, he could have asked the devotees to pray to Lord Narasimha Dev for his recovery, so that he could have stayed more and developed Tiskon everywhere. But he has not asked again to pray to the Lord for his recovery. So can you please explain why? Who's that, Yashomati? Who, who you're speaking about? Who, who you're saying someone didn't ask to pray no, to the Lord? No, I'm asking Srila Prabhupada. He could have told his disciples that they can offer prayers to the Lord so that he can recover uh, faster. So that he wouldn't leave his body? Yes. Oh, he did do that. He asked the devotees. They were saying, Srila Prabhupada, don't leave. Your work is unfinished. The Srimad Bhagavatam is unfinished. So Prabhupada said, do you want me to stay? And everybody said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. And then he said, okay, I don't mind staying, but it's up to Krishna. So Prabhupada said, I don't mind staying, but if, if Krishna has a different idea, then I go with Krishna's idea. So for some reason, Krishna had a different idea. Krishna wanted to take Prabhupada home. Because Krishna wanted, to, wanted Prabhupada to teach us the final lesson, how to go back home, back to Godhead, in extreme circumstance. And that extreme circumstance was that Prabhupada was extremely ill. He wasn't eating for two months. He could hardly take food. He could hardly digest anything. And he was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And if you look at those the, the video of those last days, it's shocking. He's only skin and bone. So Prabhupada gave us the final lesson that even in the most difficult situations where you don't eat for two months and you're only reduced to skin and bone, still you carry on preaching. And on his bed, the microphone was held there and he was giving the purports to the 10th canto. So he taught us the final lesson. So Krishna wanted us to get that final lesson, that not Srila Prabhupada should go back home, back to Godhead triumphantly, but let him go in a difficult situation. So to teach us that if we're in a difficult situation, that we can also carry on and follow in the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada. Nothing is an impediment to stop us from doing our seva, even just before the time of death. So, Krishna Rake Mare Ke, Krishna Mare Rake Ke, that's the, we live by that. Krishna's in control. If he wants to take you, he takes. That's it. We accept. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki! Go to Premanandi! So, So please take advantage. Today is Lord Narasimha Dev's appearance day. You go and appear in front of the book, which means in front of all the different murtis of Lord Narasimha Dev. And each photo is non-different than the murti. Prabhupada taught us that. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Let us thank His Grace Vayasaki Prabhu. He has shared us Narasimha Kata, Prahlad Kata, and Prabhupada Kata and his own personal realization so nicely. Let us thank him by chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Prabhuji ne abhi bataya jo lost nursing temples. To वहाँ पर बाहर बुक टेबल के बाजू में इसका टेबल लगाया हुआ है वहाँ पर आप ले सकते हैं और प्रभु जी थोड़ी देर भी यहाँ पर यू विल बी सिटिंग हियर एंड इफ एनी बॉडी वांट सिग्नेचर ऑन दैट बुक यू कैन कम हियर एंड टेक इस सिग्नेचर हरे कृष्णा तो आज का ये नरसिंह चतुर्दशी का शेड्यूल ऐसा है शाम को चार बजे यज्ञ होगा लक्ष्मी नरसिंह यज्ञ 
और साढ़े चार बजे टेंपल हॉल में कल्चरल प्रोग्राम रहेगा यज्ञ नीचे भक्ति वंध हॉल में रहेगा और साढ़े छह बजे नरसिंह भगवान का अभिषेक होगा और साढ़े सात बजे ये सभी के लिए प्रसाद होगा और ये नरसिंह चतुर्दशी का ये यज्ञ है चार बजे भक्ति वंध हॉल में होने वाला है और इसके बारे में आपको ज्यादा इंफॉर्मेशन चाहिए तो बाहर साधु संघ चैतन्य प्रभु एक टेबल लगा के बैठे हैं वहां पर आप टेबल में आपको रजिस्ट अपने आप को रजिस्ट्रेशन करना पड़ेगा और जिन भक्तों को रजिस्ट्रेशन जिन्होंने किया है रजिस्ट्रेशन उनके लिए यज्ञ में आज नरसिंह चतुर्दशी का यज्ञ में यजमान के रूप में बैठने के लिए आपको कूपन मिलेगा और हमारे जीवन में जो भक्ति में जो भी ऑब्सैकल है उसको निकालने के लिए लक्ष्मी नरसिंह यज्ञ का आयोजन किया गया है जो भक्त इसमें रजिस्टर करते हैं उनके लिए नरसिंह भगवान का स्पेशल पवित्र मायापुर धाम से दिया जाएगा और नरसिंह भगवान का यज्ञ का भस्म और स्पेशल प्रसाद कई सारे और चीज आपको मिलने वाले वहां पर अगर आप अपने रिलेटिव या फ्रेंड्स को इस नरसिंह चतुर्दशी यज्ञ में भाग देना चाहते हैं जो यहां पर नहीं है ऑनलाइन में भी भाग ले सकते हैं तो जिन भक्त ऑनलाइन में भाग लेने वाले हैं उनके लिए जूम आईडी दिया जाएगा और दूसरा अनाउंसमेंट है आईडीसी कोर्स इंग्लिश में होने वाला है ट्वेंटी एट एंड ट्वेंटी नाइन्थ मे और चार और पांच जून को ये दोनों सैटरडे संडे को होने वाला है टाइमिंग है तीन बजे से लेकर सात बजे तक जो भक्त इसमें भाग लेना चाहते हैं इसके बारे में ज्यादा इंफॉर्मेशन चाहिए तो आपको टेम्पल हॉल का नोटिस बोर्ड में वृंद देवी इंफॉर्मेशन सेंटर का नोटिस बोर्ड में या बीवी और बीवी आर ऑफिस के नोटिस बोर्ड में आप प्राप्त कर सकते हैं या वहां पर ऑफिस में जाके कलेक्ट कर सकते हैं और अगला जो अनाउंसमेंट है थॉट बूस्टर्स के बारे में वरदराज प्रभु आगे करने वाले हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा वी सीक द ब्लेसिंग ऑफ वयासकी प्रभु बिफोर मेकिंग दिस अनाउंसमेंट सो अराउंड ईयर बैक वी हैव स्टार्टेड अ वेरी ब्यूटिफुल चैनल कॉल्ड थॉट बूस्टर्स ऑन यूट्यूब सो मेनी ऑफ द डिवोटीज ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड नो दिस बट समाउ आवर डिवोटीज आर नॉट नोन नोइंग दिस दैट इज आवर मिस्टेक सॉरी फॉर दैट but we have very special request and also presentation of this channel now in front of you so this channel is uh, doing a very special service of uh, making devotees explain the verses of bhagavad gita in a very simple and very entertaining way of animation this is uh, one of the first channel of this type where you can learn the verses of bhagavad gita just by uh, the medium of a song and animation very very simple so we are presenting this channel is also in hindi and also in english thought boosters channel so we are showing you two videos now one in hindi and one in english so uh, please see the videos and after that we have an action uh, service for all of you so after the video please wait for 2 minutes that time we will tell you what to do now they will show you the video what is the anger what is the anger it destroys all you know but what gita has the answers and more lambo then caught my eye I strive day and night to call it my last it slipped away I was angry inside I lost control of my mind at the night i could not make sense of it all i feel anger nothing more my thoughts now run loose i have forgotten what is right what's wrong my mind is now destroyed to escape the hell read the gita every day escape the hell read the gita every day that mistake that you made you will regret it all your life greed will take from you it will take your life away when there's so much anger it takes all control 
Until you find yourself You're just another drifting soul When your intellect turns on you How will you live your life? You've become the sole reason for your own fall The Bhagavad Gita holds these immortal truths The Bhagavad Gita holds these immortal truths To escape this hell, read the Gita every day Escape this hell, read the Gita every day Krodh kyo aata hai, binash ke laata hai Chaliye dhekhte hai भगवत गीता में कल दिखली सड़क पे एक लंबर गिनी उसको पाने के लिए मैं करू दिन रात काम वो न आई मेरे हाथ पर गुस्सा मेरी नाक पर कंट्रोल ही नहीं था मेरे गुस्से पर वो रात पर नहीं पाया मुझे कोई भी समझ में क्योंकि समझ नहीं अब मेरे बस में नहीं आए अब अच्छे विचार कोई भला बुरा भूल कर बुद्धि का विनाश से बचने के लिए गीता को पढ़ो क्या ऐसी गलती जो करी है तुमने वो देख के तुम पछताओगे लालच में आने से तुम अपना सब कुछ खो जाओगे आता है क्रोध फिर उतना जो ना सह पाओगे कुछ भी समझने से पहले ना समझ दिखलाओगे बुद्धि विनाश होगी कैसे जी पाओगे अपने विनाश का कारण खुद तुम बन जाओगे ये सब भगवत गीता में सदियों से लिखा हुआ है ये सब भगवत गीता में सदियों से लिखा हुआ इससे बचने के लिए गीता को पढ़ो इससे बचने के लिए गीता को पढ़ो